Hey everybody, uh, my name is Clemens. I'm a Scrum Master um, at Cybert Media. Thank you very much um, that you all been here, like all the watchers from outside for this tech talk. And um, thank you very much that uh, you three are here as a speaker for the day. And um, you three have all very interesting talks that uh, you will talk about today and which kind of like all are about diversity, which is um, like a very, very important um, topic. And I'm very happy that uh, we can have you three here. And so thank you very much. And um, without further ado, I will um, introduce uh, Francisca and I guess she will talk about um, her topic and about her. And yeah, Francisca, thank you very much that you're here. And there you go. Oh, you're still muted, Francisca. That was a slip up. I'm back. <laughs> uh, I was just saying, Clemens, that uh, thank you for, for introducing us. And the topics that we are looking at today are basically at the intersection of diversity and tech. And this is one of the urgent topics. And um, the meetup actually originated when I started talking to Paul, who is sort of the, the, the brain um, of a lot of these meetups, uh, about the fact that we there is more that we need to do. And there are a lot of topics as well in diversity that we need to look at, not just, let's say, gender diversity, but also go, go above and beyond that. But also, as I said, uh, put a focus on that as well. I will be talking about accessibility for developers today because at the end of the day, inclusion matters. And how you can do that, I will elaborate in my talk. So a little bit about me. My name is Franziska Haug. I'm a people lead in engineering. That basically is an engineering manager without being an engineering manager. So I manage currently three IT teams from a coaching and disciplinary point of view, but not from a technical point of view. We have tech leads in the company for that. I'm also a freelance consultant on the site uh, and developer operations community, also a bit of recruiting and obviously accessibility. And I've recently become the co-organizer of the accessibility meetup in Berlin. And in a couple of days, we will have a meetup on neurodiversity. Um, and I all invite you very much to attend that as well. We have also one Microsoft CTO who will be speaking about his experience of being on the autism spectrum. You can all find me on Twitter under the handle underscore frenzied. Um, so please tweet, tweet as much as you can about the contents of the, this event today so that we can spread the message of increasing diversity and increasing accessibility. Currently, I'm also knee deep into developer stats for Germany. So if you want to know anything about developer insights, uh, job market, language interests and so forth, don't hesitate uh, to reach out to me. So why? Why am I talking about this whole accessibility for developers topic? A short while ago, when I was giving the talk, there was this, this big, big astonishment that oh, there are blind developers out there. And this is why what you get usually when you talk about people, in, especially in tech, that have some sort of disability or chronic illness. It's like, oh my god, I didn't even know that blind developers existed. And then you get taglines like this one how to get a developer job when you're blind, advice from a blind developer. The day we hired a blind coder, judged by skills and experience, not disability. Or you even get what it's like to be a software engineer at Amazon, which should actually not be like a tagline in, a, in, in an online portal or newspaper. Why should it be something special that a person who's blind is a developer? Yes, a lot of blind developers don't even use a screen and there are probably not a lot of blind front-end developers, but still, they're just as capable, even more capable, and I'll tell you why um, in an example later on. Also, um, you get the same for, let's say, hard of hearing developers when how it is to be a deaf developer. And what a lot of people don't know is that there is actually a forum uh, in Germany for people who are uh, deaf or hard of hearing in IT, which is called the Deaf IT Conference that usually takes place around once a year, maybe not in Corona times, but um, so, so we do have actually, they are networking and they're exchanging and it's, it's still for me very interesting to hear that why should this be, be an exception. The same goes for, as I said, one of my speakers that I have uh, next week who is a CTO and who is on the autism spectrum and talks about his experience of being in tech and, and sort of a different perspective on life and, and on, on work even in a lot of ways. Um, but still, why should this person not be a CTO or not become a CTO? 
And then also uh, what I recommend also just in general is the Accessibility Club in uh, mostly Germany, they're active here, but also in a couple of other countries where there are a lot of meetups where you can learn about all sorts of conditions and challenges and also how tech um, can help uh, with that. And this is also one of the reasons finding the community <clears throat> and exchanging with the community made me realize that um, there are these different perspectives. I myself live with chronic illnesses, um, chronic illnesses that are not really well researched. So it's always a challenge of explaining why I, things do, why I do things differently. But even more so, I wanted to speak up for those that basically, um, or what, what, what peers and supporters can do to enable people who have a disability or chronic illness. So if we look at what are we actually looking at in the realm of accessibility? We need to understand that there are different kinds of disability. There's not just one kind. The most let's say, apparent one is having a visible disability. So a person sits in a wheelchair, they wear glasses and just carry around a stick. So they are obviously uh, in some shape or form motorically um, uh, uh, have motoric uh, impairments or they have uh, they are blind or um, have a, a not, a, not such a good vision. But then there are also non-visible disabilities that are not apparent at first glance, maybe because um, that person um, is just, you don't, you don't see it when they move around or, you know, but it's still there. And then we also have temporary disability. And this is what not a lot of people are aware about, but imagine someone has an accident and then goes to surgery. Temporary disability can also be when you, for example, take care of your young child and then you always have one arm full, right? So you only have an, one arm to move around. This is also, these are a lot of the perspectives that tend to be forgotten, especially in tech. And we need to understand that before we actually move on to the solutions. Then there's the whole vast field of chronic illness to which I belong also. Some of us are well-researched, like for example, diabetes, asthma, those are uh, chronic illnesses that are very well researched. I have uh, chronic illnesses that are not very well researched. So um, please join me every year in celebrating the rare disease day. This is a very important day for us. And ultimate category is also neurodiversity, which is not a disability per se, but it's important to know that with neurodiversity, so for example, ADHD, uh, being on the autism spectrum, having Tourette syndrome and so forth, come different mannerisms that are often not uh, categorized as or often categorized as weird or as non-standard at first glance and also challenge uh, some people in just in seeing, acknowledging that, embracing that and also questioning or leads to the question of how can we actually support people with that. But the thing is, accessibility is not just something that we look at for chronic Ill, chronically ill or disabled people. Disability is the design of products, devices, services and environments so that they are usable by everyone. So it's not just, let's say, for the special people, and I put that in quotation marks, it's enabling access for all people at all times. And this is where it also ties into the developer experience. Developer experience, when we look at the concept, is when broken down, is basically what kind of, or how are the tools and how are the environments designed so that developers can have a great experience coding, uh, pro um, providing the great, great products for the end user and so forth. And this is when we look at it from a monetary perspective, also a vast field and a very uh, valuable field in a way. So the more we can enhance developer experience, the more also everyone um, in the company benefits. And this also impacts then the, the development of products at the end of the day. So how can you actually do that? Um, I've been talking about all these kind of definitions and don't worry, you don't have to know it all at the, the first glance. But I want to leave you with a couple of tips and, and easy to take away things that you can do in your everyday life at the workplace to ensure that people who might need a bit of extra support are welcomed and embraced. And I brought with me three friends of mine that I would like to introduce you to. The first friend is called Samira and she's a backend developer. Samira was promoted to senior backend developer at Singapore SASS provider Calendar Candle. She has been deaf since the age of five. She experiences severe back pains due to arthrosis. Samira needs time to realign and focus. She chose Calendar Candle because there was already a hard of hearing developer, so she wouldn't be alone. She finds it challenging at times to interact with her colleagues. And she wishes that sign language interpreters were available more often in the company. Especially the interaction bit is challenging for Samira. 
I once worked with a, a dev developer and he was basically glued to the cell phone all day long. Why? Because it enabled him to communicate with his peers. And in Samira's case, uh, most often when there are group meetings like stand up or there is a retro, then for her it's difficult sort of to follow. But there's a lot actually that you can do to support Samira or if Samira was your colleague. And one of these things you can do is to have uh, subtitles or captions uh, in meetings. Nowadays with technology that works really, really well. Also for people that are not, let's say completely deaf, but hard of hearing uh, or need some other kind of uh, um, printed out uh, uh, language support. So you can just add a, a Google meeting, a Google meets a link or some other me a link where there is a functionality to transcribe what is being said. And you already have so much more support for people on your team. As I said, cell phone to use that, give people that might need it, even though it might not be, let's say, super, super apparent always, give them a cell phone so that they can actually communicate with their surroundings without any, let's say, um, uh, mediums. Having a sign language interpreter. Nowadays, probably with the corona and home office situation, I would imagine that a lot of these services are also offered online. And in fact, uh, from the perspective in Germany, there are government programs that will fin finance sign language interpreters that come to your office and interpret. We often had a sign language interpreter come in for the larger meetings, and that was sort of also had this mass effect of if there's one person that can benefit from that, two, three, four, five, six persons can benefit from that. So really, really efficient, and it might be a, a good thing to look into what your country provides uh, on that front. Having a good workspace setup, especially with uh, Samira's back and her back pain, just providing her with a setup that is good for her. Uh, let her tell you what she needs, and then you can set up the, the space accordingly. Also, with people who are hard of hearing, it might be good to place them in a, in a setting where they can see who is approaching so that they are not surprised when somebody just comes up to them. And also ergonomic devices, standing desks, anything that can help in that situation, that is tailored to Samira's situation specifically. And what I've also found very, very useful in a lot of situations is just having a quiet room. Sometimes this, the medical room is used for that so that Samira can withdraw to that, can refocus if she needs to, and then sort of step out uh, to her colleagues again. I'm also Obviously, I'm talking about this whole situation uh, when we're all back in the office again and, and uh, all together. Um, but even just thinking about that in a home office situation, there are also a lot of points that you can take away um, for that as well. Meet my next friend. Uh, name is Charlie, QA engineer. Charlie is lead QA at London Gaming Studio Game Bus. They are a wheelchair user. They are able to walk very short distances, though. They have an undisclosed autoimmune disease. They fear the team's planning days. They cannot make use of the provided food that a game bus has on offer. They feel lonely as they are the only one in the company who is different or who is better said perceived as being different. So how can we support Charlie if Charlie was your colleague? Charlie immensely benefits also from a good desk setup especially when they need to go to the toilet. Um, how, how can they make sure that they don't need to walk long distances? Flexibility in remote working. For Charlie, it's very, very beneficial to work remotely so that they don't have to come to the office every single day because public transport is challenging, moving around with the wheelchair. They don't always get the support that they need. So just having the flexibility of having team members remote already supports Charlie in a great way. Also people who are out on the team. And what do I mean by that? Uh, I'm a person, I speak very openly about my chronic illnesses and I also did it while I was job hunting. Um, a lot of people that I speak to who, are, who have a disability or a chronic illness, um, they fear repercussions. They fear that they might not be hired, that they might be punished for saying that because they are being perceived as weak or as different or weird or something like that. So having people in the workplace who are proud and out and talking about this and are not being afraid, people who show courage, that gives people like Charlie a setting where they feel comfortable talking about what they are dealing with. 
And especially with, with their autoimmune disease, obviously, this is something that is still steeped in a lot of mystery. And having that support that they can talk about something that's not very well researched and where there are not a lot of answers to be had, that already is a big, big step in accessibility. As I said, weakness is accepted. That a chronic illness or disability is not being seen as something that's making people weak, but that's making people strong. I always say that as a person with chronic illnesses where there is only experimental treatment to be had, I have to take a lot of hard decisions on a daily basis. And that doesn't make me the, 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 the opposite of, of a week. It makes me strong because I, I bring all of these experiences and all of these, um, the, the, these characteristics to the table to an employer that others might not have had as an experience. So being proud of that, having this awareness and allowing people, giving people the space to talk about is very, very important. Pl things like planning can be done remotely and Corona has taught us that, especially in tech, we are much more flexible than we might think sometimes. And it's really good to just uh, know that you can use video technology, you can use other kinds of things to make sure that people are um, involved and they are aware and they can participate they can. even if they sit remotely. My last friend, Kwame, is a technical writer. Kwame recently joined Action, the provider of an accessibility suite in New York. He immigrated to the US from Ghana to have better working conditions. He is legally blind. What that means is basically he can still see some shapes and forms, but essentially he cannot read any text. He uses the company's own screen reader for a lot of his work. He is supported by colleagues with design reviews, however, because he can write amazing texts. He also likes to code. As I said, um, even as a coder, you don't have to be able to see. There are lots of tools that enable you to code very fast, uh, but he cannot see pictures and does not assess um, if there is no alt text, if they fit, for example, into a tutorial or into the documentation. And he is disappointed that action caters well to his needs, but constantly disregards employees with less severe illnesses. So how can you support Kwame? Kwame obviously benefits from having a screen reader present at all times. At action, it's easy for him because they already provide that technology. One of the fellow speakers I had at a previous meetup, he, his story is fascinating. He codes with the help of a screen reader and he can listen to 450 words per minute. Imagine that this is the power of voice technology and people that are trained to use their other senses in that way. And he does it in English and in Finnish, which is just mind blowing if you think about it. He codes completely without screen. This is amazing. Kwame is the same. He can, with the screen reader, he can navigate really well through um, uh, programs and software and everything, but it also has to be made accessible. We talk a lot about web accessibility in the, let's say in the field of accessibility, but web accessibility is something that you need to be consciously invest into. Same goes for tooling. If there is no functionality to move around with the keyboard, for example, or some, some other aspects like color contrast and so forth, the best product is can be the best product, but it's, it won't be accessible. So for Kwame, this is essential. Also having voice technology, not only at his workplace, but throughout the building um, can help uh, Kwame move around, orient himself and so forth. And when we look at the, the colleagues that Kwame was worried about, what I found really, really useful is to have, for example, things like anti-bias trainings where you may have some exercises where you explore this whole perspective that as a, that a healthy person might never have had before, that there can be different realities in this life and it's okay. One person's reality does not have to be the other person's reality. It's about embracing that person and making sure that they feel welcome and that they can thrive with whatever they need um, uh, to do that. So um, this is very good. There are also a lot of other formats like diversity training and so forth. A lot have a strong focus on gender diversity, but not only. Uh, so I, we all see diversity from this intersectional point of view where, where it's people of any background that is perceived as being different benefit, or we all benefit from having a different perspective and seeing um, the, the other people's reality. And what also is really, really helpful and beneficial is coaching. I find that um, especially in environments where there is not an open feedback culture, where there are, as, as I said, there's a fear of repercussions, you can help people shape that culture by helping them um, come to their own conclusions and, and realizing that 
whatever it is that they need to do. For example, goal setting that can be functional, that can be professional, but also in, in relations to how do I interact with people at the workplace. And uh, coaching in that sense means a guided questioning and, and, and guiding uh, along a certain topic um, versus just uh, maybe the picture of somebody being trained or mentored on a specific topic. I employ that a lot with my teams and I find it very, very helpful in, let's say, opening up minds and hearts. So, and this is also basically what I want to leave you with is we talk about accessibility, especially in the realm of developers and having sort of this developer experience and the tool being great and so forth. It's not necessarily that only. Um, it's the most important thing is actually your mindset and how you actually approach things. For example, do you even perceive a difference between the normal and the unusual? How do you perceive people with disabilities and chronic illnesses? And most importantly, how do you talk to them? They are people just like you and me. And the only difference is that they might need some extra support to then become high performers or great performers at the workplace and to contribute with their ideas and, and their acumen. And as I said, in a lot of situations, what we bring to the table is, is so beneficial because we have that different experience and we have that different perspective. And diversity and being not just sort of straight laced on one topic already increases the bottom line as well for a company. So challenge yourself, think about what kind of mindset do you have? What do you do when you, when you visibly see a person who's, or a person who you perceive to have a disability, or if you hear that they have a disability, what goes on and, and what happens with you? It's always good to question yourself. And basically the most important thing that I want to leave you with is heart. Heart is the best thing you can have. Show heart to your colleagues in any kind of situation you can imagine. And they will thrive and you will be able to support them and you will find solutions together because if there is a will then there's also a way definitely so just to ramp up my talk um, who do i get all this wonderful info from uh, a lot of it is personal experience obviously in managing it teams where people um, also uh, work there who live with chronic illnesses but I have to say Twitter is an amazing source. Uh, there are a lot of people with disabilities who communicate openly. There is a great community that supports itself. So I can definitely recommend if you're looking for resources to follow people on Twitter that have the topic of accessibility, let's say in their, in their um, communication, in their profiles, but also um, to, to, re to do the research yourself. And also most importantly, to listen to people uh, to hear what they are saying, what they require, as I said, in the workplace, and then you will uh, be able to support them a great deal. Thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me anytime. I'd be happy to support you and to, to talk some things through with you. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. This was uh, very helpful, very nice insights, um, as well as like, especially for me, who um, yeah, as a man, I have um, like issues with uh, yeah the correct pronouncing of like stuff and like talking. A lot of things you said in your talk is like yeah, it's for a lot of people new. And um, thank you very much. Like I had a lot of um, epiphanies for myself here, so um, <laughs> thank you um, as well for me very much. And and Clemens, one other thing. There yes. are more people around you with chronic illnesses and disabilities than you might realize because not a lot of people are open about it, especially when it's not visible. So just keeping an open mind is great because then people will be comfortable and will be telling you things about themselves. But but this is like really interesting because when it comes to, to mental health, I kind of like already have this kind of mindset. But like after you talk, like I, I see now that there's like a way bigger and broader um like way of a different kind of like illnesses and um, stuff that affects people and um I, I just i just guess now that a lot of people like my like near like workplace have probably these kind of things but obviously are not that open about because i don't know mm -hmm. they they fear and and stuff and um yeah as a that that helps me to think of that and um yeah do, i guess do stuff differently than um, at work. So thank you very much for that. Um, we will have now a short like technical break um, where we will like set up for our next speaker. 
And so just stay in the stream. I guess we will be back in around like one or two minutes. So thank you very much and see you soon.